Hello everyone, and welcome to another video, Criminal Law, where we're going to look at actus reus and causation. Um, please like and subscribe if you find this video useful. Uh, there are some more in the series coming along. So, with this being essentially the first substantive topic, the simple formula that we need to remember is that actus reus, um, guilty act, the physical element of the crime, plus mens rea, which is the guilty mind or mental element of the crime, equals a crime. And as we sort of move forward discussing criminal law offences, this typically is other sort of two elements that we're looking for and would need to explain, certainly in exam answers. There are obviously exceptions. Um, first and foremost, the topic strict liability, where uh, only the actus reus is, is needed to be proven. But on the whole, uh, that is the sort of presumption in, in criminal law, that these two elements will be there. So looking at that further, um, as I said, what does the term mean? Guilty act or physical element of a crime. Um, the actus res will be different depending on the crime. So again, as we move to other uh, substantive topics, for instance, when we deal with murder, the actus res will be the unlawful killing of a reasonable creature in being under the king's peace, whereas if we contrast that with, say, theft, the actus res is completely different because that is not a crime uh, involving a person, uh, that is against property, so it would be, as we'll learn later, um, where, you know, the uh, defendant appropriates property belonging to another, so that's sort of the actus res part, so just bear in mind that it changes each time. Now, there are two ways in which uh, the defendant can commit the actus reus, and we just need to bear this in mind as we move forward. Um, again, this is typically for crimes, I would say, against individuals, um, but um, against persons, but we'll see as we move forward. So, by an act where the defendant does something, or by an omission. Now, what is an omission? An omission is not simply saying where there's a, a failure to act because obviously you can fail to do a number of things you can fail to uh, submit your homework it doesn't mean that it's a crime although maybe it should be no what we're talking about here is it's a failure to act when there is a legal duty to do so set in precedent in a case or perhaps it's statutory law um, so that's really where we're, we're starting uh, here and the question is, is the actus reus for a crime present in these scenarios? So just having a quick look, and you can pause the video and sort of read these through and, and, and make your decisions. You are driving in your car when suddenly you suffer an epileptic fit. Now, let's bear in mind here that you are driving and it's, you know, you, you're, you're not aware that you're an epileptic. This is the first time that this has happened because obviously if you were epileptic, and you knowingly then went into a vehicle and, and and so forth, that would indeed be a crime. But you're driving a car when suddenly you suffer an epileptic fit and it causes you to crash into a motorcyclist who comes off of his bike and breaks his leg. So just at the moment, is the actus reus there? Is there an act or, or an omission? Secondly, your eccentric Aunt Fanny comes to stay with you over Christmas because she is ill. She stays in your spare room. However, after a couple of days, she refuses to come out and hurls insults at you. You decide to leave her alone. She starves to death. And then lastly, you accidentally leave your eight-year-old son home alone at Christmas in the rush to catch a flight to Paris. So, with respect to the first one, um, the motorcyclist who comes off of his bike... The answer is no, because the act or omission, it was quite clearly set out in law, it should be voluntary. So it should be something that the defendant has willed their, willed their uh, muscles to do, their, you know, consciously wanting to, their body to act upon. And we can kind of see that point of law in the case of Larsner. So that's our sort of supporting precedent here, our supporting evidence. And Larsner was this case where a woman was uh, deported from um, a country, I think actually from memory, I think it was deported from England to uh, part of Ireland. And then when she touched down uh, in her new destination, this was all against her will that she was deported. 
they um, arrested her for being found in that situation as an illegal alien. So this actually, as a case, will come up again and is linked to another topic when we deal with, say, strict liability or indeed absolute liability crimes. But just for the moment, one of the points there was that the court said, you know, there there is a presumption that um, an actus reus should be a voluntary um, action choice. The second case involving uh, centric Aunt Fanny, um, very similar to a case of Stone and Dobinson, except there it was an eccentric, um, why well, say eccentric, mentally ill um, older sister. And I believe there we had the um, the sibling, the brother, taking her in. And of course, I think the, the brother and his partner, they or he certainly had low IQ and he wasn't really fit to look after her, but nonetheless accepted. And with her being mentally ill, the sister uh, and needing proper care, and I think she was also anorexic, she stopped uh, you know, eating and they got sick of her erratic behaviour and just sort of left her be and she ultimately died. Uh, and the law did say here that this was an example of an omission where there is a duty of care. So they, you know, accepted her into their house, into their home voluntarily, saying, you know, we'll, we'll look after you. Perhaps you might say there's an issue of whether it was fair to say, um, you know, were they capable of looking after her, as I said. But nonetheless, where you voluntarily undertake a duty and then fail to, you know, meet it, then it will be an omission in terms of actus res, and that's Stone and Dobinson. And then the last one for the eight-year-old son, um, great Christmas film as well. If we just go there, we say, yes, this is another example of an omission. And there are many omiss uh, omission cases where you know you have to identify in the exam that particular type of uh, duty and link it to the correct case. So that's really what they're asking. So here... It's uh, typically what we'd say a duty because of a relationship, uh, you know, parent-child. And so Gibbons and Proctor is the key case we can use. Um, in that case, you have, um, I believe it was the father and his mistress, and they were meant to be caring for his uh, seven-year-old um, child, and they neglected her, and, and again, she, she ultimately died. I think from starvation. So there is a case that is quite clear on the omission uh, for a duty because of a relationship. If we just have a look at, I think these are the last two for the moment. Uh, it's Christmas Day. You're serving up the Christmas pudding to your family. You cover the pudding in brandy and light it. However, as you approach the table, you trip and fall. The pudding falls onto the carpet, which begins to smolder. Instead, you all decide to watch the Queen's speech. Well, now the King's speech on television as a fire breaks out in the living room. So, actually I'll do, I'll, I'll mention the second one, then we'll come back to that one. Um, the second one, as you walk your dog by the river, you see in the distance an old school bully you haven't seen in years who has fallen into the water. They're in some distress. You choose to watch until they go beneath the surface of the water and then you continue walking your dog. So, with regards to the first one, and you know, pause the video and, and make your decision. But we can say, is the actus res for a crime present here? And we can say yes, because this is another example of an omission where there was a duty of care to, to you know, to act. And this arises because of a chain of events or a dangerous chain of events being set into motion by, by the defendant. And the key case here is Miller. Um, and, and Miller, in that particular case, we have a, um, a sort of squatter, a uh, homeless person, if you will, who was in a property um, and they were sort of sleeping on this mattress or, or to, you know, and at one point lying on this mattress, he was having a cigarette and then he fell asleep. And of course, that then, you know, the cigarette fell on the mattress. It started smoldering um, smoke. He wakes up rather than do what would be the common sense thing and perhaps try to you know, put it out or stop it from smoldering or, or, or call someone or whatever it might be. No, he just decided to go off into the next room and go back to sleep. So of course a fire started and it led to a significant amount of criminal damage because the building 
was set fire. I don't believe anyone was killed, thankfully, but uh, the defendant was found liable for the crime of arson, uh, and the actus reus was fulfilled by an omission. Now, the second one, um, and I think we can all probably think of uh, school bullies of that that we may uh, remember. Interesting point of law here, because you would expect something to be done, but the truth is, no. You have not uh, committed an omission in this case, even though it appears that there's a failure to do something, because there is no law in the United Kingdom as to uh, you acting, or what we would otherwise call a Good Samaritan law. Now, the Good Samaritan law, I believe some countries have, such as France, um, sort of impose on you this uh, duty to, to act, to do something. And uh, actually, if we go to the next slide, you can see, I mean, the question I normally ask my class is, should the UK have a Good Samaritan law? And the three questions I sort of focus on is, or rather are, should failing to help someone be a crime? If so, what punishment should be suitable? And do you think there would be any problems with imposing this law? So um, I, I do mention at this point, or indeed the students uh, may well have read that when sadly Princess Diana passed away um, under the uh, tunnel, I think it was in Paris, wasn't it, in France? Um, again you know what caused that i think you know her, her driver i think the uh, final found findings of the case were the coroner's court that um he had been speeding i think he had been intoxicated but they were being chased by paparazzi um on motorbikes and so forth down the tunnel and they were trying to flee that and obviously sadly that tragedy happened but when princess diana's uh, car with her partner i think it was dodi wasn't it fired crashed into the pillar um, rather than in the immediate aftermath the paparazzi on the motorcycles you know trying to, to help her or get medical aid as she was sort of uh, lying there dying in the car um, and of course the drop you know um, I think there were other people in the car that obviously perhaps could have been saved or one could have been saved uh, they they didn't they just carried on taking photographs so France actually threatened to um, prosecute them under Good Samaritan law. So anyway, in relation to this, uh, you might have your own view, um, and we'll come back to this, but essentially, no, the UK doesn't have this law. So, a bit of evaluation here, and of course there are three assessment objectives that uh, an exam question, certainly as I'm talking here about AQA law, A-level, would expect you to deal with and this wouldn't be for every question so let's just say for the moment that typically um, if it's a problem scenario question which I think the smallest problem scenario question you can get is 10 marks obviously 30 being the the largest at the end two of those um, you've also got a 15 marks question on the AQA paper which is a sort of theoretical uh, or, or certainly a valuative question. So this is a good thing where it was sort of, particularly the 15 marker, draw upon those sort of substantive topics that we're talking about or starting to talk about now. So just to do a bit of analysis and evaluation, of course, when you're, when you're sort of citing precedent, you know, your cases to support the points you are and you're explaining why that case is relevant and so forth. I mean, it's all in your analysis, isn't it? So you're picking up marks there. So we can say for the Good Samaritan law, first of all, there are logistical problems. So for instance, what if you know more than one person witnesses a crime but doesn't do anything? Is it fair to prosecute them? So you know, I say to my class, if you witnessed um, you know, someone, um, someone being mugged in the high street and no one acts, how many of those people in the high street, and it could be a busy high street that, that are witnessing this uh, and do nothing, should or can be you know realistically prosecuted and again would that be fair um yeah, particularly i suppose you could say what if you know one of the people in the high street was uh, you know a little old lady who's quite frail and so forth you wouldn't expect her to suddenly jump in and and do something and i don't you could say well the law's not necessarily arguing that you know it could be call for help do whatever but it's just it's very very difficult isn't it to to kind of make this law quite workable 
And what if, for instance, someone pretends to be a victim of a crime? So um, they take advantage of your good nature and you see someone perhaps it looks like they've collapsed, you know, uh, in, an, in an alleyway or, or something like that. And, and this, you know, you try and help them. And in fact, they end up uh, robbing or assaulting you. So you could be putting yourself in danger. Uh, you know, likewise, if I go back to the one with the mugging, what if they're armed? What if they have a knife or something? So same point sort of uh, is relative there. Uh, so what, to what extent should rescuers be putting themselves at risk? It could cause more harm than good. So that's really all the points of evaluation that you might want to raise uh, regards to the Good Samaritan law. But I mean, typically, would you get that as an exam question? I, I'm not sure, but um, it, it's, it's there anyway. Um, and then, of course, we can talk about omissions. And if I just highlighted, as I said, Stone and Dobinson earlier, and there is a topic uh, called fault, which is linked to one of the 15 mark questions. Certainly, um, as we're talking about paper one crime right now for AQA, and we'll come back to this later, but it's worth, you know, questioning, you know, generally speaking, for you to be uh, liable for a crime, you have to be at fault. There has to be level, some, some degree of um, culpability or responsibility, or, or let's put it another way, blame. And as I said with Stone and Dobinson, when he and his partner accepted in his elderly sister, I said earlier, you know, is it is it fair that they were held at fault when she um, died, when she didn't receive the, the care and medical attention that she needed? She was mentally ill. They were not in the right position and probably not entirely um, knowing or aware of, of what was wrong with her or the degree by which you know she she wasn't well and they had low IQ I believe as well so um, yeah if the brother's got a low IQ and doesn't understand is it fair to impose that that's a sort of interesting point to make uh, causation then so that's essentially for the moment actus reus um, causation is the other element that the prosecution will have to establish linking to actus reus so in other words the prosecution have got to to argue with evidence in court that there must be a direct link from what you know the defense has done or, or not done if it's an omission to the consequence and you know this this chain represents well it represents fault doesn't it? it represents blame so without this you can't find the defendant guilty so really, really crucial. And of course, this chain, the law, generally speaking, when it's established, it's a hard thing to break. But we're about to discuss in a moment that there are some instances where that's possible. So I did a sort of brief summary of causation here. So I'm just going to pop this up. Uh, so essentially what you've got to remember is there are two uh, sort of causes or two tests that the prosecution will always have to prove. So the first is factual. Um, the second one we'll move on to in a minute is legal. So the point to remember is both need to be passed. One by itself is not enough. So for factual causation, uh, the prosecution will have to establish the test of but for is used. And I've put down two cases here that uh, kind of illustrate this in, in different ways. I think Hughes is the more recent one, uh, about 2013, but it's entirely your, your choice in the exam. So, but for the defendant's actions, would the victim have died um, anyway? And if I start with Padgett, so I think that's a good illustration. I think from memory, Padgett was where you had um, a man take his uh, pregnant 16 year old girlfriend hostage along with actually another member of his of her family but i think they managed to escape out the vehicle or, or you know at one point and he took her back to you know sort of the where he was holding her um and by that stage the police and such had been alerted you know he, he had a gun um and you had the armed police outside the building and he takes his girlfriend the defendant um outside with him to confront the police and he's using her as a human shield and then he starts firing at the police now the police returned fine unfortunately um 
they hit the pregnant girlfriend and she dies okay so the defendant survives and his argument is essentially well you know i didn't kill my girlfriend you know it was the police that killed her now obviously for public policy reasons if you think of it that way the law is never going to accept that argument you know it really you know it's a case of well you put her in that position didn't you so the police were just trying to do their job now obviously there may be an argument with regards to um again you know it says civil liability but that's another that's that's another issue entirely so clearly if you hadn't have done that she wouldn't have died therefore and so we want the answer to this test to be no you know but for the defendant's actions would the victim have died no because you are the cause you are factually the cause so that is part of you know causation proven but remember we need the other part i think the hughes case uh, is interesting because you had a situation uh, where I think it was a camper van driver who was driving without insurance and then one day they were confronted on the road with a intoxicated driver and that driver was driving in the wrong lane so basically it was a head-on collision there was really little if anything that you know uh, the driver the defendant Hughes could have done and of course with the intoxicated driver that died and it then subsequently went to court, you can see, can't you, that we could say, but for the defendant driving, you know, on the road in the camper van that day, would the other driver have died anyway? And you would say, no, because obviously the, the cause, the factual cause is the collision. But the courts did accept that, you know, it would be wholly unfair to hold the camper van driver Hughes at fault to blame for that. So, hence why we have the second bit, which is legal cause. So, we need both. Both need to be passed. And legal cause is a little more complicated because there are a few other rules um, that might also be applicable in an exam problem scenario. Um, and really, it's worth noting that to try and distinguish factual from legal legal cause is when we start to ask ourselves you know should the defendant be at fault or to blame for that and clearly as i said in hughes it would be unfair to say the camper van driver is at fault or to blame so the question or rather test that uh, we have here is uh, twofold we've got um were the defendant's actions the operating cause so in the instance of smith you have a situation where two soldiers in a barracks are having a fight i think it's a knife fight um certainly the defend um defendant stabs the um other soldier the victim in the in the chest and sort of in the lung so other soldiers then try and you know hastily intervene and take the injured soldier by stretcher to the sort of nearby uh, medical center for treatment but unfortunately they drop him on the way off of the stretcher which obviously doesn't do him any good and then when they get to the medical center and someone begins treating him there um, they start to do i think it is chest compressions and of course be it that he's been stabbed in the chest in the lung that essentially hastens his death quickens it um, I think I, I read somewhere about 75% um, chance of survival or, or, or such um, had that not been done. Now, the question here is, who is uh, the legal cause or who is at fault for the soldier's death? And as I said before, the chain of causation is really difficult to break. The law, you might say again, for good reason, really wants the person who started that chain of events um and ultimately you know what killed the victim to be the, the you know the one that's responsible at the end so they asked themselves what was the operating cause of death for the victim and the court clearly answered well it's the stab wound by the defendant and therefore the defendant soldier was found liable um for his death now you could say again that that uh, 
might potentially be unfair because we just said that the medical treatment you know was poor and clearly killed the victim uh, more quickly um, but for public policy reasons would the courts want to prosecute doctors who essentially are just trying to save you know the man's life albeit doing a poor job um, there has to be recognition that you know medical treatment could cause a break in the chain and we're going to come back to that in a moment so that's the first thing in the exam if you're unsure who's responsible you might just say you know right what was the operating cause of the injury or death um, we know that in terms of legal causation if the defendant makes a, a sort of I'm going to say significant um, I, mean, I think you might have heard the word substantial but if you hear the word significant contribution then clearly they're at fault and they're at blame for the injury or death um, it's worth noting the de minimis rule so de, minim de minimis uh, means the defendant's actions uh, or omission must be a more than minimal contribution so if it's a minimal contribution if it's a trivial contribution the defendant is not going to be liable at fault and be prosecuted um, so it has to be more than minimal uh, and this really also recognizes the fact that um, more than one person for, in, for example can be um, liable at fault for the injury or death uh, so if we were just to say, um, let's see, uh, diminutive contribution. Well, actually, we're going to look at an example later re regarding that. But Kimsey, that's, we'll use that. That's the case, isn't it? So Kimsey, you had the defendant and the victim, and they were, you know, illegally having a race, sort of, you know, speeding. Um, and the victim lost control of the car and ultimately died. The surviving driver who was racing with him uh, was to be prosecuted and they simply asked you know was there a more than minimal contribution made by that uh, driver in causing the death of the victim the other driver and because they were both engaged in this illegal racing the answer has to be yes so even though the other driver you know was racing themselves and, and speeding and all of that we can say quite clearly that the other surviving driver contributed something that was more than minimal and therefore is the legal cause. All right. So um, we want, you know, the answer to this test to be uh, yes in these instances. Uh, otherwise, there won't be, um, you know, liability and causation proven. Um, there are some optional legal tests which are only going to crop up in, you know, say a problem scenario if the examiner uh, puts them there. And there's sometimes some clues. I mean, you know, we've got uh, one here. It, I, we can call it the thin skull rule or the eggshell rule. Either way, uh, it's perfectly fine. And that is where the defendant must take their victim as they find them. Now, in the case of Blau, just to illustrate what we have here is we have a woman who um, spurns the advances, the sexual advances by the defendant. The defendant, you know, gets angry and stabs her. Um, she's rushed into hospital um, and she's offered a, basically, you know, the treatment is you're going to need a life-saving blood transfusion, um, which I think it was pretty clear would, would have saved her life. However, the victim who was stabbed was a Jehovah's Witness and it was clear that part of her, you know, religious belief is that there shouldn't be any medical intervention so the victim you know died um, then we look at that chain of causation and that this was a charge of murder as you, as you obviously you know the, the defendant stabbed the victim and you would say here well you take your victim as you find them including for example any of their religious beliefs and so the defendant was liable for murder now you might say that's unfair on one respect because obviously, had she taken this treatment, she would have survived. And probably, you know, most people certainly would have taken the treatment. But that doesn't mean the law is going to discriminate against people who have, for instance, you know, religious views. Um, and we, we can say again, can't we, that, you know, what was the cause? 
you know, of her death or what was the operating cause. And it goes back to, it was the defendant that stabbed her and she died of the stab wound. Now, of course, underlying um, health conditions uh, are also relevant to this test. And I think typically in exam scenario, that's usually what they present you with. Um, they might say directly that the victim has a thin skull, which is a condition, um, or some other you know ailment that means that if they uh, are injured by the defendant, that that injury will be a lot worse uh, because of that underlying um, health condition. And so... Um, Again, you know, it, it makes sense, doesn't it? If if if, if the defendant is going to um, punch someone and they have a thin skull and therefore they suffer a worse, you know, worse injury, sorry, worse injury and die, then it's only right that they should be held at fault, you know, to blame for that. And you can't, you're not going to have a situation, are you, where the defendant asks... Uh, you know, the victim before they punch them, you know, do you have any underlying health conditions or anything like that? No. So this is about protecting vulnerable people, you know, people that perhaps also might well be disabled. Now, the second uh, test here is, um, I think it's uh, phrased sometimes in some textbooks as the daftness test. For a, We'll come back to that. Were the victim's actions reasonably foreseeable to the defendant because of what they did? So let's just talk about Roberts for a minute. In Roberts, you had a um, young, you know, young girl victim who was, I think, um, picking up or got picked up by the defendant. So she was hitchhiking, I think. And she wanted to, I think it was go to a party or something. And it was, this is the 70s. So they, I guess, you know, a lot more trusting uh, some people back then. Um, and rather than drop her off at her destination, the driver kept going so clearly she knew something was wrong and then he made indications that essentially made her fear that she was going to be sexually assaulted and so what she did in an attempt to escape was jump out of the vehicle the moving vehicle and she did suffer injury as a result but managed to escape and then when it came to court the um, driver essentially their argument would be well i didn't cause the injuries i'm not at fault or to blame for these injuries because she chose to jump out the car and i think you know what this rule establishes is if the victim does something but it's you know it's reasonable and it's foreseeable to the defendant that they would because of the way that they have acted towards them, perhaps presenting a threat, as in this case, then it won't break the chain of causation. And in this instance, the driver, who, uh, you know, basically was threatening to sexually assault her, would be liable. Now, if we flip that for a minute and say, what if the victim did something that was so daft? So I say to my students, for example, I say, you know, you are, uh, you know, you You've got you're, you're driving along. You've got um, a girl in the car with you that you sort of fancy, and you say to them, uh, "Would you like to go to the cinema next week?" And she looks at you, and then she jumps out the car. Obviously, that is not a reasonable reaction. No reasonable person could foresee that someone would do that. Um, it's completely daft, hence the daftness test, and therefore it would be unfair to hold the defendant the driver in this case who was asking her out on a date to be uh, at fault so causation really important uh, so far we've done actus res and causation and these elements you know when you're dealing with paper one crime in aqa um, a lot of this is being reused again i mean just to give you a link to future topics i mean obviously any sort of broadly speaking any crimes against people so we've got murder We've got, um, you know, uh, involuntary manslaughter. That is, if you remember, unlawful act manslaughter, otherwise known as constructive act manslaughter, gross negligence manslaughter, non-fatal offences like assault, battery, uh, section 47 ABH, um, section 20 wounding or GBH, and then you've got section 18, um, you know, uh, the same again. All of these instances is where causation is relevant, but it's not going to be relevant if you're dealing with property. So theft and robbery, you will never have to discuss causation there. Um, 
Now, it's probably also worth saying that for some offences, so if I just mention uh, involuntary manslaughter again, so remember that was the unlawful act, manslaughter and uh, gross negligence, when you look at the elements you know, required to be proven by the prosecution for those offences, they explicitly, clearly mention causation, so you're going to have to mention it. Whereas if we say uh, non-fatal offences, and you've got an exam question on that, I wouldn't be inclined to discuss causation um, unless, of course, the examiner has put in the scenario a particular issue. So, again, it's a future topic, I know, but if, if somebody, uh, again, say in a scenario, punches somebody, uh, this question is focusing on battery, but that victim suffers a, 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 you know, a worse injury because they have a thin skull, Clearly, they're wanting you to consider that issue, which is a causation issue, that Blau case, that take your victim as you find them. And so I would expect then for you to discuss causation and, and focusing on that issue in particular. All right. It does take practice, but I think that's really where the examiners sort of go. Now, yeah, just at the end, there must be no intervening acts that break the chain or the D will not be liable. All right, so remember, we're, we're thinking of a chain here. I know it's imaginary. So the defendant's actions, or their conduct, I should say, because it can be a mission, the defendant's conduct is a direct result of you know, the person being injured or killed. Um, now, these cases I think we've just dealt with, haven't we? So I'm just going to click through them. Feel free to uh, pause the screen, but we, we've just discussed them. So I'm going to move on. Uh, I do like to ask my students, why do you think criminal law has the thin skull rule? I think as we just sort of said, you know, for reasons of protecting vulnerable people, for the fact that the defendant is still ultimately, you know, the direct cause of their injury, that is why this law uh, exists. Uh, so let's talk about medical treatment, because, of course, with medical treatment, this is something that examiners like to focus on. And, we, and I did mention that there is a possibility of it breaking the chain. Now we know in Smith that that didn't happen. The two soldiers that were fighting, one being stabbed in the lung, um, going to the medical center, getting poor treatment, hastening their death, but the courts held fairly or unfairly, 1959, that the soldier that stabbed um, the victim who ultimately died you know, the stab wound was the operating cause of their death, so therefore the defendant is at fault to blame. However, if we just take the case of Jordan, uh, 1956, um, and you can see here with my facts, I'm trying to keep them brief um, when I write them down. You can probably, as a revision exercise I do with my students, I try and say, you know, focus on three words, three words to, to describe the facts to trigger them in your mind. But obviously when you begin, you'll need that detail, I accept. So in Jordan, what we have here is um, a defendant who was stabbed, they were in hospital, and I think sort of slowly recovering, when one of the doctors gave them antibiotics as part of their treatment. Now, of course, they were unaware at that point that the victim um, in hospital uh, was allergic to antibiotics and they did indeed suffer that reaction. Now the doctor then made a note uh, and left and I think then sometime later, uh, the next day or otherwise, another doctor came along failing to read those notes and gave an even larger dose of antibiotics to the victim which sadly caused them to die uh, from that reaction. So when the person, the defendant who had, you know, in this case Jordan, stabbed the victim was taken to court, um, it was decided that in this instance medical treatment can break the chain if it is, and it's worth trying to remember this quote, but if it is so independent of the defendant's acts and so potent, palpably bad as to cause death, so it was death in this instance. So what we're saying here is, um, and in exam scenario, all right, you can ask yourself, what was the operating cause of death? That was the case we dealt with for legal causation. 
and it would be quite clear probably that you know like in this scenario they the victim didn't die from the stab wound they died from the drugs they were given and therefore that was so independent so different from what the defendant did and you know the court would accept that it was really bad treatment really bad treatment in that instance that imaginary chain of causation between the defendant's acts and the resulting victim's death would break and when it breaks it means there's no liability at all um, and I think you would say that's the fair outcome in this case I mean the defendant's still going to be liable for something clearly but is it fair to have them be liable for the death of the victim and the answer has to be no um, so some argue you know is there really a difference between the treatment in Smith and treatment in Jordan well I suppose you would say in the Smith case even though it was poor treatment um, they were trying to save his life um, and he did die from the stab wound whereas I think in this case Jordan the distinction the court was trying to make is um, it's a completely different reason that they died and it was something that never should have happened it was just really bad palpably bad treatment it's a fine line but that's really where the law is and I think the other thing we should mention in uh, Malsharek is that um, here you've got a situation where um, you might find in a problem scenario that the victim you know again has been attacked stabbed they're taken to hospital um, and they're put on a life support machine and that life support machine then ultimately is turned off by the um, doctor because the person is in a vegetative state they're brain dead there's no electrical activity anymore from tests and such that they do um, the argument here that the defendant tried to make which was I you know having been charged with murder I didn't kill uh, the victim it was when the doctor chose to turn the machine off the courts don't buy that because they accept it as the ratio decedendi in this case the doctor turning off life support machine does not break the chain and again for public policy reasons it's fair isn't it because why would the courts want to prosecute a doctor that has done everything in their power to try and help to try and save that patient uh, and is unable to do so because effectively when you're brain dead you are no longer there um, so yeah I think again you have to say what was the operating cause of death and it was the the stab wound that led to to everything else so in that case even if they're trying to save the person and 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 you know <sighs> In doing so, the person falls into a coma and or, 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 or whatever it might be. Yeah, it's still the defendant's fault. Right, so key vocabulary here. Um, I apologise, my Latin, I've never studied Latin. Um, I, I, part of me wishes I had, but I'm going to say that's Novus Actus Intervenens, uh, the new intervening act. That's just the Latin phrase for, for a break in the chain of causation. And we've just seen, haven't we, that, you know, medical treatment that is palpably bad so independent of what the defendant did can break the chain so that's the first thing medical treatment can if it's so bad generally speaking like in the smith case the courts don't want to make medical treatment a, a reason to break the chain but if it's so bad and so independent of what the defendant did that they die from it yes that's the first thing second thing it could be natural causes now, I don't have that on here, but as an example, there's the case of White in 1901, where a father, uh, sorry, father, where a son um, tries to kill his mother. He puts poison, I think it was arsenic, in her tea and gives her the drink and, and walks away. Now, she dies of a fatal heart attack before drinking the tea. So we can say that, you know, like a heart attack or a, it could be an earthquake or, or whatever, a natural um, event would break the chain and it would not be fair for the defendant to be liable in this case for murder although clearly attempted murder would be relevant um, and then the other thing that would break the chain I think we were saying up to now was the daftness test so if there were a situation where the victim uh, acted a certain way 
that wasn't reasonably foreseeable to the defendant, such as, as I described, someone jumping out of a moving car with you because you asked them out on a date, then again, that is not going to be relevant uh, in terms of causation. Uh, it will break that chain. And I think the case of Williams uh, is a good counterpoint to Roberts because that involved a hitchhiker. I think from memory, it was where the story was that the hitchhiker attempted to rob the driver and then jumped from the vehicle and killed themselves. And of course, it would be unfair then to prosecute the driver because A, they didn't know they were going to be robbed and B, they didn't know that they, that they were going to try and jump out of the car while it was moving. Um, quite different to Roberts, where you know the driver sort of made it quite clear to the victim, or, you know, or certainly it was in their mind that they were going to be sexually assaulted. So why wouldn't somebody then try and escape? So, so that's the three things that we have. So breaking the chain, there we go, Roberts, and there's Williams. And um, again, I'll leave that there on the screen for you if you want to pause it. But there are two cases, and they're quite counterbalanced, where the first one is, you know, reasonable uh, actions by the victim, and the second um, is not. Okay, um, I'm going to sort of generally skip over this one, but in class we looked at the Mark Van Dongen murder trial. Uh, there's an article, if you Google BBC News, you can find it. It's a very sad case, uh, but it's an interesting one from a legal perspective in terms of dealing with the issue of causation. Um, Mark Van Dongen, the picture there on the left, um, he uh, had, you know, was in a relationship with, I forget the, uh, big pun, I forget the, uh, defendant's name, the girlfriend, the picture in, in, in the middle there, and she threw acid over him, uh, which caused life-changing injuries. He was in a great amount of pain, uh, and later on he subsequently decided to end his life through euthanasia. And then it was uh, a matter of would she be liable for his death um, in causation? I mean, her argument at trial, I think, was that um, he had tried to use the acid on her or some such thing, but it wasn't believed by the court. And I think what's interesting here is that although ultimately Van, Mark Van Dongen committed suicide, um, the court would only have found the, uh, the girlfriend uh, guilty if they were satisfied that, I mean, factual cause we've dealt with, but legal cause that you know, he, uh, she had made a significant contribution to his death, um, that there was a more than minimal, at least, contribution to his death. I mean, it doesn't always have to be significant. I mean, it may not always be significant, but it's certainly more than minimal. And, um, and for whatever reason, the jury in this case um, weren't satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt. And so she was found not guilty of murder, um, but she was found guilty of, um, I think, whatever the relevant offence is, sorry for um, using, you know, acid on the victim. Okay, um, just a quick scenario. So again, I think this illustrates it quite nicely. Rachel discovers that her husband Paul is having an affair. So there's Rachel. Unfortunately, Paul, they're having an affair. She discovers this, but she doesn't tell him. And Rachel plans her revenge by giving her partner, Paul, a fatal dose of poison before he goes to work. And he works in one of these um, sort of city high-rise buildings, as you can see there. Now, when at work, uh, Paul is angrily confronted by uh, Choi, whose wife apparently he's also been having an affair with. So he's been extremely busy. Um, to say the least, and during this argument, um, Choi pushes Paul out of a window from the high-rise office building. So, for for argument's sake, let's say you know they're ten floors up. But also at the same time, uh, as a quirk of fate, as Paul is falling to his death, there happens to be a sniper from a nearby opposite rooftop, and suddenly seeing Paul fall. Uh, from uh, the 10th floor, he decides, you know, 
I wonder if I can shoot a moving target, and actually shoots and kills Paul before he hits the ground. So this scenario is completely fictitious, completely made up, but the question I ask my students is, you know, who is criminally liable for the murder of Paul? So again, you may want to pause this, uh, but we discuss, and ultimately it's interesting, it gets you to apply factual cause, and of course the factual cause, you could say, is met certainly by, by uh, Rachel, by Choi, and by the sniper. But the ultimate answer, I think, for this one is, you know, they have to have made a more than minimal contribution to his death. More than one person can be liable for, in this case, the murder of the victim. So if we take Rachel, we can actually say it's not simply a more than minimal contribution that she's made. She's made a significant one because it's a fatal dose of poison. He's going to die. It's just slow acting. If we go to Choi, um, has he made a more than minimal contribution? Uh, yes, we certainly can. I mean, you might say again, it's a significant contribution because he's going to fall to his death ultimately. Um, a lot of people say, well, the sniper is a significant cause because, it, you know, the... the um, victim here, Paul, uh, dies actually from the bullet. But either way, all of them are certainly a more than minimal cause. Perhaps we could argue that Rachel, um, or, or indeed certainly Paul, uh, sorry, the Rachel or the sniper are the significant cause, but they're all going to be liable for his murder. So yeah, um, again, just a stop off point for um, some assessment objective three analysis and evaluation. So obviously when we're discussing the cases and ex uh, explaining why we, we think a precedent is relevant and so forth, um, you know, indeed, sometimes a problem scenario the examiner presents you will um, have, will it will be very similar to a case that you've learned. And obviously the examiner's done that for a reason. They want you to make that link they want you to raise that case. So for argument's sake, if it's said in the scenario, as I said before, you know, someone is stabbed um, and uh, actually say again, someone is punched and we use that thin skull example where the injury they sustained is much worse and perhaps they die or suffer brain damage. It should be making you think about the case of Blau, uh, the Jehovah's Witness case who was stabbed in the thin skull rule. But we can say for the thin skull, as we said before, um, you know, it may seem unfair on face value to hold the defendant at fault for something that is far worse that he couldn't possibly foresee. You know, the defendant wouldn't have foreseen in Blau that the victim would have, you know, uh, rejected medical treatment. Nonetheless, as we said, for reasons of public policy and protecting vulnerable people, the defendant remains at fault for causing the injury or death because they are the operating cause of death. And then for poor medical treatment, um, we can say here that, you know, generally, remember, it won't break the chain, but if it's so independent and palpably bad, you know, potent enough to have killed the victim, insofar as they've died from something completely, you know, different from what the defendant did to them, then obviously that's the, the fair sort of outcome. It would be um, unfair, wouldn't it? Like in the Smith case we mentioned with the soldiers and the barracks and the fighting and the the medical team that basically did poor treatment and hastened his death by the chest compressions on the lung injury. Does the law really want to be in a position where they're prosecuting doctors? Generally, they want to hold the person who caused the thing in the first place to account but like I said, with the case of Jordan and the antibiotics, if it is so independent and so, you know palpably bad, really bad, you might say well, it was in Smith, but the law disagreed. But if it's really bad, and I think we can say in Jordan it was, because the second doctor ignored the notes, gave an even larger dose of antibiotics that was clearly written down as you know the patient being uh, allergic to, then I think, again, it's only fair that the law recognises that the chain of causation can be broken there.
all right of course it also arises linking with other topics doesn't it because you could have situation there gross negligence manslaughter for for the um for the doctor who gave that fatal dose you've also got actions in civil law as well basic negligence uh, sort of thing in, the, in in that tort um but anyway just for now focusing on crime paper one that is what we would we would say so if you would like to have a go at these again freeze the screen if you want so we've got is causation in fact and in law so we want to try and apply both now you may need to go back and look at your notes or go back to the uh, slide that had the uh, summary that we discussed we want to try and apply both and get you used to that so is causation in fact and in law proven in these three situations so Robert has an argument with Pierre outside of a nightclub as he witnessed him chatting up his girlfriend who works behind the bar. Robert approaches Pierre and punches him in the face. Unknown to Robert, Pierre has a pre-existing injury and weakness in his cheekbone from when he played rugby at school. Pierre suffers a broken eye socket. Is Robert liable for causing Pierre's injury? Now, if we're applying what we know, we would say here yes. Because factual, there is the uh, but for test has been satisfied. So if I if I click back for a second, um, but for the actions of Robert punching Pierre, uh, would he have suffered that injury? And we would say, well, no. So clearly, the factual cause lies with Robert. Um, if we click back a sec, we also know to need the legal cause. Has a significant you know contribution been made? by um in this case it was robert wasn't it um it's certainly got to be more than minimal and i think it's clear here that it is more than minimal in fact it is the significant um reason for the injury the punch um i would again you know i'd be using the case of smith there as we discussed earlier but you would have spotted as well that there was the underlying health condition that kind of made that injury uh, you know more severe than it would have been otherwise from the pre-existing that's the word they use pre-existing because of the rugby uh, incident and so therefore that's the thin skull rule that's blau and then lastly when we've applied factual and legal and if both you know parts are there you've got causation now sometimes the examiner will um perhaps you know put in something regarding a, an intervening act that might make you discuss the possibility of the chain being broken or, or medical treatment we've been discussing so far but when you've done with factual and legal just then afterwards you know are there any intervening acts and look there's no if i go back again there's no third party there's no one else to blame it's not you know medical treatment or otherwise there's no natural cause um victims own actions and so on and so forth so no that's a pretty clear cut one, but with thin skull added in. Now we've got Jiang plays for their local football team and suffers a very late tackle from Shin, who is angry at Jiang for scoring a hat trick. Jiang suffers a broken leg and is taken to hospital. Due to poor medical treatment, Jiang suffers from a permanent limp. Is Shin liable for causing Jiang's injury? So Immediately, you're probably your eyes are cast toward the, word, the words poor medical treatment. But, you know, don't jump the gun and think, right, this is medical treatment. It's going to break the chain. Remember, the sort of presumption to begin with is poor medical treatment will not break the chain um, unless it is so independent of the defendant's actions here. So this is um, Jang. And, you know, so potent enough to have uh you know and he's, he's basically really bad palpably bad to have caused in this instance the permanent limp so let's start with factual you know but for uh zhang's actions uh no, sorry i get this right the wrong way um shin beg your pardon shin is the defendant but for shin's actions would zhang have suffered that injury the answer is no so that factual causation test is met that was the case of Hughes or Paget to support it. Then we go over to the legal causation side. Um, has Shin made a more than minimal contribution to Zhang's injury? 
um, it may even be the significant cause we have a look here I think we can agree that it's certainly a more than minimal cause um, indeed it's significant isn't it it is the tackle that causes this um, and then ultimately we ask is there a break in the chain of causation and we come to that medical treatment bit and um, indications here is that it wouldn't be enough to break the chain um, ask yourself for a moment what is the operating cause of uh, Jiang's injury what has caused it and the cause is the tackle the very late tackle that's what makes it criminal because we know we have a football to contact sport and such but it's the very late tackle and there's clearly a reason there's mens rea there um, the medical treatment here is not so independent of, uh, you know, they were just basically trying to treat that injury. So it's it's a bit similar to the Smith case, isn't it? So it won't break the chain, and it looks like um, Shin will be liable. And then we've got Daniel is accused of sexually assaulting a girl. The girl's father, Lenny, confronts Daniel, and after a fight, stabs him with a knife. Daniel receives medical treatment, but later decides to reopen his wound in an attempt to commit suicide. Daniel dies. Is Lenny liable for causing the death of Daniel? So we start again, factual. Uh, but for the actions of Lenny, would Daniel have died anyway? The answer is going to be no. So that test has been met. We now need the legal test. Has Lenny made a more than minimal contribution uh, to Daniel's death. Um, I think we could certainly say that is true here because he has stabbed him. I think we want to ask ourselves, you know, what is what is the operating cause of death here? And looking at it here, the operating cause of death is the stab wound still. So even though we have a situation where the victim has reopened their wounds, uh, it's interesting to note that won't be a break in the chain of causation. And that's from the case of Deer, 1996. So basically the facts of that case, very similar. Victim stabbed, um, victim later reopens their wounds, seemingly in an attempt to commit suicide. And the court accepted that the operating cause and the you know legal cause the fault the blame remained with the defendant now we've got two more uh same thing being asked rhiannon is involved in a car accident having been hit by rita who was drink driving rhiannon suffers a broken pelvis and arm which requires surgery during surgery, Rhiannon is given too much anaesthesia and suffers a cardiac arrest, so her heart stops. She is resuscitated, but suffers from permanent brain damage. Is Rita liable for causing Rhiannon's permanent brain damage? Um, again, factually, um, but for Rita's actions, would Rhiannon have suffered that injury? And the answer is no, so the test is met. We go then to the legal cause. Um, so we're asking here is, has you know Rita made a more than minimal contribution to uh, you know to that injury? And I think the answer has to be yes, because you know she did hit her with the car. Um, what was the operating cause of death here? Um, sorry, I'm saying. Death. she's not dead is she what's the operating cause of the injury and i think it's at this point we start to depart isn't it because it would appear to be it was the fact she was given too much anesthesia so then we consider what can break the chain of causation we think about the act of a third party we think about medical treatment that is not just poor but palpably bad really poor and we ask ourselves still from the Jordan case, you know, is this a situation here where um, the permanent brain damage is a result of medical treatment that is so, you know, so independent, therefore, of what the 
defendant Rita did as to cause that permanent brain damage? And the answer is uh, yes. So there is no causation here. The palpably bad medical treatment is by itself, you know, so independent to have caused that injury. Murphy has a knife fight with a rival gang member, Jordan. During the fight, Jordan inflicts a deep cut on Murphy's finger. Murphy fails to take care of his wound and it becomes infected, resulting in gangrene, so, you know, a very serious infection setting in. The hospital advises the finger should be amputated, so it should be removed, but he refuses and then the infection spreads and he later dies. Is Jordan liable for causing Murphy's death? So again, by this stage, I think you know, you know, um, but for the actions of Jordan, would Murphy have died anyway? No, that test is met. Legally, has Jordan made a more than minimal contribution to Murph Murphy's death? Um, I think you could say uh, yes. And then we have to ask ourselves, you know, what was the operating cause of death here? Now, it seems to be his refusal for medical treatment. So if I just pop this up for a second, the defendant here, um, Murphy, is still going to be liable. So it's kind of similar to the Smith case. In fact, this case and its facts are most closely associated with a case called Holland, where you know essentially the same thing happened, and the courts weren't prepared for there to be a break in the chain of causation. They felt that the fault, blame, in terms of legal causation, should remain with the defendant because they are the ones that uh, you know uh, put that person, the victim, in that position. It was the operating cause of of death. Still, it's kind of also similar, isn't it? I suppose to Blau, where you have someone refusing medical treatment. But of course here, we haven't got any sort of religious beliefs or anything like that. Right, I've reached the end of the uh, first uh, topic, actus race and causation. I hope you found this useful. Uh, the next topic that I'm gonna be covering is um, mens rea and the associated rule. So you might want to check that out. But otherwise, thanks very much. And I wish you all the best with your revision.